Hello, everybody. How are you doing? How is your day? Has your working week finished? Yeah, this is Grandmaster Art Connections as usual, and it's that time again for a boot camp. Hello, Manfrick uh, Lone Ghost. I see you're very, very determined there. Just chill. And uh, <clears throat> right, so today. Today is the day when I'm gonna do my next bootcamp. Uh, so the previous one, those of you who are watching, it was about the cause but structure, but I mean, those of you who are here for the first time, so what is the bootcamp? I started this tradition last year, and uh, a bootcamp is a special stream uh, during which I explain some kind of... Um, a theoretical uh, stuff from the game of chess so should it be opening should it be in games calculation um, positional game etc so today I was I was actually checking what I've done before and I couldn't really believe that I've never touched the converting advantage it's quite quite strange and uh, thus it was quite an obvious topic today so today we are going to talk about converting the material advantage. So what does it mean? What does it mean converting material advantage? It means you are getting some extra material in a game, but you need to be able to bring it to a full point. Hello F. Yeah, you're in time. I started 10 minutes earlier. I just couldn't wait. <laughs> hello, hello. How are you? Dr. Zebrafish. Okay, hello there. Yeah, so, so that is the idea. That is the idea. We want to take our extra pawn or extra exchange to the full point. So that is a long road ahead, but hopefully after today I can explain at least some of the most important concepts that you are able to use in your games. All right. So, I'll start with the very first example. Um, let me uh, select it. And then I'll slowly explain the theory, the way I see it. So, we have this position. I mean, what happened before, it doesn't matter. It simply doesn't matter. So, we have this position. Black has just played g5, and now the question is, how will we continue here, right? Seemingly, Black has a strong attack, because White King is exposed, but we have an extra piece. We have an extra piece on c5. Hello, Lassant. Hello, Broom Bunkinator, everybody. So, what I want first to mention here, the very first technique is what I call the simplification. So what does it mean? It means you need to understand how much material you need in order to get the game to win. Thank you, Cop Review. Thank you. Appreciate that. So you're looking at this position. Forget playing game uh, chess as a game where you need to take every single pawn, every single exchange. Your goal is to get to the point, to the full point. So here Black has just played g5. I definitely wouldn't consider a move like h takes on g5. Why is that? Because it's super risky. So for example, I, I, could, consider, I could consider with Black to play queen h to check. King f3, rook takes on g5. Oh dear, this already looks so dangerous, right? The pawn on g3 is under attack, and do you have really a good feeling that the extra pawn on c5, it plays any role? So indeed, we already have extra material. I suggest to play queen of one. After queen of one, we are ready. I have the special terminology. I'm not sure if somebody else really uses it. Sell the pawn. So I'm selling the pawn on h4. The idea is revealed here. After queen takes on f1, if black accepts this, I play probably with a king. King takes, g takes, g takes, 
rook h4. So what we have done, we have sold one pawn in order to kill our opponent's attack. The question is, is this position winning? Yeah, that is, by the way, one of the most important qualities that you should be able to develop throughout the years. But I think having two pawns on a3 and on e4, yeah, I think it's win I think it's easily winning. I think it's easily winning. With a proper technique, it's easily winning because if we won't trade both pawns, then we should be able to convert this because black doesn't have connected pawns. Had he had, let's say, something like the pawns not on h7, but on g7 and the doubled c pawn, let's say, on e6, completely different case. Here, they're just weaknesses. So I simply have an extra piece here on c5. So I'll start with something very basic and then slowly, slowly, I'll try to add more principles. So, after queen f1, obviously black is not interested. He is not interested to trade queens, and as somebody already mentioned in the chat, not queen g4 as well, because queen g4, that's the same. That is exactly the same. I play queen e2 or queen d1 you choose. I guess queen e2 is the simplest. And queen h3, now this rook drops. So that is now impossible. So after queen f1, queen c8. Black still tries to keep some kind of attention on the board. So again, the question is, do we want to take the pawn on g5? I mean, we could. We definitely could. So for example, here, h takes on g5. I'm not sure how should black really play here. I guess something like rook takes on g5. The king is still feeling not very good. I mean, probably with very accurate play, I should be able to secure its position. But I think I can do better. So I'm still trying to sell the pawn. Instead, I propose to play queen d1. I attack the rook. Queen a6 is going to be queen f1. Zebrafish, uh, it doesn't change anything. Unless you want to take the pawn on c6. So queen d1, I'm attacking the rook on h5. G4 closes the position, we are quite happy. No, G4 is simply going to be king G2, our king is safe. So, black plays rook h6. Again, remember, we just need the knight, the rook, and a couple of pawns. So, I'm still selling the pawn on h4. What do I do? I exclude the black queen from the game. Queen d7, I make it impossible to go to h3. Yep. I'm still selling the pawn on h4 because I know it should be enough for me to win the game. Now, after queen d7, queen b8, we go back. We pin the rook. He can no longer take an h4. So, black plays something. I mean, he has to keep the game going. He is obviously seeking some kind of um, um, ways to trick me. What you have to understand here. A g takes on h4, no, you just take the rook, you take the rook on h6. What you have to understand is every single player, I think you can relate to this if you are playing, if I'm playing, if everybody else is playing. Everybody is playing until one moment, until we have hope. And I think the part of the converting material advantage is persuade your opponent. This case is hopeless. So that is all about, not only we want to get from having an extra advantage, extra material to a full point, we want to force our opponent to resign as quickly as possible, because he's going to be fighting unless he's hoping for something. So here, my opponent's chance is to somehow try to trick me, try to get to the weakened white king, some tricks, because there's a rule, you can always resign. Right? Nobody has saved points by resigning early. And since my opponent is still playing, he is hoping for something. So keep that in your mind. Queen takes on g5, king h8, reroute the queen, though the only square which was uh, black's hope. Yeah, because of the king situation exactly. Queen e5 check, f6, queen c3, queen goes back to h3, here, here here that's it 
Now, at this moment, it's completely clear, uh, completely clear. Black's last chance has evaporated. There's nothing going on. The White King is safe. White is simply enjoying extra peace, so Black stops the clock. So he was really hoping until some moment he can try to trick me. I played it accurately. I was selling the spawn in order to simplify the position and he didn't, he, he didn't have a choice because that is losing. He was seeking some chances and he lost. So this part of the converting of the material advantage I call simplification. And simplification or transforming of the advantage is one of the biggest parts of converting material advantage. We take this situation, well, let's say we have a lot of pieces and we try to get it to something simple where we have less pieces, less possibilities to make the mistakes uh, and, yeah, and get closer to a winning game game. Presumably we know how to play them, right? Right, I'll show you the next one. Um, <clears throat> the next one example is quite tricky, actually. So we have this position. It's more than trading, definitely. It's more than trading, more than trading. F. So we have this position. A white has three extra pawns. Now, I think it's very, very important once you realize that the technical phase of the game has started. Hello, Metal Eagle, how are you doing? Once you realize that the technical game, uh, technical phase of the game has started, you think about schematics. What kind of position I want to reach here? So, for example, you're sitting here, you, you just played a very crazy first time control. Let's say the time control is over, this is move 41, you have three pawns, all the hostilities, hostility, hostilities are gone, and you're already thinking, I should be able somehow bring this game to a full point, I have three extra pawns. What is the fastest way to do this? So I'm thinking, I mean, I would like to checkmate. I would like to checkmate black somehow. But I'm checking all the options. I mean, rook f7 is gonna be king g5. Uh, I could play rook g8, it drops the pawn on h3. Not so simple. So let me show you what happens if you don't have a clear plan. So rook f7 is easy, right? That is a good question, Ferdinand said. If you are feeling if you are feeling confident if that should be enough now that is going to be a big question so now after rook f7 check king g5 let's say i take it here i take it here i play king g2 bishop c5 and let's say something like c4 now that is quite obvious i'm not going to get a checkmate here yeah because my opponent simply doesn't have enough pieces to cause me any trouble however Let's say black plays rook b6. Now the question is, please tell me a plan, a clear plan how you are going to play this for the win. <laughs> because after rook e5, a uh, long ghost, uh, please behave, okay? So if you're gonna play something like rook e5 check, king goes to f4, rook f5, king e3, you still need to watch out your king's safety. So it's not really so simple. And also there is another idea that black is threatening with rook b2 check, take on a2 and organize some kind of a counterplay. So you could play passively rook e2 with the idea, okay, I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait and see what happens. And let's say black plays king h4. And again, the question is, where is your plan? What are you doing here? Because black can play a5, a4, a3, as long as you are not pushing the ape on yourself and you want to push the pawns but they're not just pushing forward so instead i think it's very important to think about in terms of the schematics rook e6 is probably fine lasan but let's go back let's go back to this position so i think it was fair to said who already said in chat if you know that the opposite color bishop endgame is going to be a win go for it so i know this i know this it should be winning so the game progressed like this 
Rook f7, Rook e5 check. Black simply doesn't have any choice because after King g6, I can take it here, I can take it here. Bishop f5 check, and as soon as my pawns start rolling forward, they're unstoppable. So black cannot do that. The only chance for black is to play King h4 and block them. So now what do we do? We take here, we play King, King g2, Rook e5, and now since we already have a clear plan, we have a clear schematic, what do we want to do? We know we want to transpose this position, take from this point, from point A to point B, to opposite color bishop endgame. I think it's simpler bishop f7. A bishop f7 you play rook h5 check, so my opponent tries to stop it at, at all costs to play bishop g5, but simply he doesn't have the time. So rook h5 takes and takes. Now, about this position, the question is, how do I know this is winning? I've studied end games. I've studied end games, so I immediately recognize one position. I've had a boot camp about the opposite color bishop endgames. I believe it was maybe one of the very first boot camps. I think so, at least. Opposite color bishop endgames. I mean, I don't remember the number. But there was this rule that the position is probably a draw if the defender can block two pawns on the same diagonal. So let's say I don't have where I have to position. Uh, these pawns but let's say i would have not the g pawn but the f pawn and the opponent is able to block them on the same diagonal now that is the rule also of course it's very important how far they're from each other but there's something else i mean reason number one the bishop is not holding them on the same diagonal do you see it's holding on the same diagonal it's not number two I have an extra pawn on h3. I mean, okay, it's blocked, but it's there. Number three, there is a pawn on a2 and a6. So I have blocked pawns, but I have an extra pawn on h3. I have also in addition the pawn on a2 and the pawn on a6, which might play a role. So I go here and I know this is winning. So the game progressed, c4. King goes here, so my plan is very simple. Go here, push the pawn forward, and if necessary, I just drop the pawn on h3. I just don't need it. Now after king, king of 6 h4, that's it. That's it. Here, just push it forward. The pawn on h4 is completely irrelevant. Here, c5, resignation. This also marks a very important next rule. So let me go back. So this position. Let's say, let's say you're not sure. Let's say you're not sure. You're seeing all of this. Let's say you're seeing rook f7, king g5, rook e5, king h4. You see how to trade the rooks. You see there's going to be a rook h5 check, but you are not sure. Is this winning or not? What is the right way to proceed? I've always believed from a dominating position, never go for a position if you're not sure. It's so simple. I mean, you're always going to get chances to trade pieces. You're always, you, you will always have that. Don't force into positions where there is no way back. I mean, you can always trade pieces. But as far, as far as I know, if you are not promoting the pawns, there is no way to put them back. So if you're going to trade the rooks, both rooks, and for some reason there is a draw, that's it. I mean, you cannot go back. So I suggest always think about this. If you're absolutely sure you'll be able to convert this, go for this. If not, keep some pieces on the board. Keep the position as unorthodox as possible so that you have more chances and if everything fails then you trade rooks and then you try your luck i mean you're not sure but you have nothing better so that is simply that's how how chess works all right 
one more example so right now we are talking about simplifying the position the next game <clears throat> so we have this position and it's very easy to misplay it's white to move white has the extra pawn and we are thinking again, again, how to take the game from point A, having a great position after the middle game with an extra pawn, to the point B, easily winning in game. First, I want to make sure I am not missing any chances from our opponent. So the question is, how is our opponent going to bring the king into the game? So I guess it's only bishop takes on e5 because if he will take with the knight knight e5 knight e5 bishop e5 bishop b6 i believe this will be a winning position quite easily because two pawns pushed by a bishop they move forward a lot faster second thing is what we don't want to miss is our opponent plays f6 f6 e takes king f7 takes somehow e5 and tries to activate the king all right that part is clear now the question is what should we do here because everybody who has studied the end games you know that you should try to activate the king as quickly as possible because king in the end game also is a piece not always there are exceptions for example here i'm thinking can I push the A pawn immediately? So uh, what I propose to consider is A4. Point being, knight E5 captures, captures, bishop B6. These pawns are unstoppable. So we just go back with the bishop, position the king on C4, A5, B5, A6, B6, that's it. I mean, these pawns are unstoppable. There's nothing our opponent can do. He can take with a bishop. Bishop takes to e5. Take. Take. And now let me show you how quickly it's possible to uh, how quickly it's possible to misplay it. Let's say we play bishop takes on b6. Bishop takes on b6. I'll play something like king e7. Let's say king e2, king d7. King d2 is a fork. Bishop d4, something like knight f3 bishop c3 king c6 b5 king c5 and suddenly you start to realize wait a second it's not really so simple i mean the opponent the opponent has activated his pieces and should be a technically winning position but you still need to show quite a lot of technique so instead let's go back the critical moment arose here after bishop takes an e5 what kind of technique it's important to remember here is that after knight e5 knight e5 remember you are not supposed to think too much about every single pawn every single exchange sometimes positional gains they are more important than one extra pawn so in this position, it's actually quite paradoxical that instead of taking the healthy extra pawn, white simply wins by a5. After a5, takes, takes, the black king cannot make in the square. So this is the square. If you studied some of the end games, you know that the king should be able to make it in the square otherwise it's simply unable to stop the pawn so what about the knight apparently the knight cannot stop it as well so the question is how do you how do you play here knight c4 a6 you're gonna play knight b6 knight e7 the same applies here you cannot play knight b6 because i just take it the only chance is knight c6 here let's say something like here a7 and you have to go away a piece trade and trade and when i see this position from afar i need to be sure 
that I can win this. If I am not sure that this endgame is not winning, I cannot go here. I mean, this is obviously a winning position. Black is pushing forward e5, f5, f4, as long as you are not taking on a 4, which probably is still winning, you should be able eventually to get something like, let's say something like this, I'm not sure. Something like this. So the pawn on e5 drops, the pawn on g4 drops, and the rest is easy technique. Because you already know how to push forward the pawn, which is strengthened by the bishop. So that's it. That's how we do it. But you know, I've seen many people, many players, who are taking without thinking. They see, oh, there's a pawn on b6, I just take it right away. So bishop b6 without thinking, because that is the automatic move. It's not like that. So you have to be thinking about schematic, what is your plan. So if you play a4, my plan is to push forward the a pawn. I, I'm ready to sacrifice the pawn on e5 as long as the black king is not in time to catch it. So I guess after something like king e8, I can still play a5. b takes, b takes, a6, a7 seems to be simply unstoppable. So that's it. Now. Another way how I could try to play here instead of the a4, I could play bishop d4. I protect the pawn on e5. For some reason, I care about this pawn. I shouldn't. I shouldn't really care about this pawn. Because if I see my a pawn is moving forward, the e5 pawn plays zero role. So let's say here black plays king march. Yeah, king march is a good idea. So let's say here black plays b5. Suddenly it's not so easy, right? I mean, of course, of course, should be winning. I mean, you are supposed to bring the king closer, maybe to the g4 pawn, but all of this is slow. Uh, let's say we decide we can take the pawn on b5. Knight a7, I'll play something like, what can I play here? Something like bishop e5, bishop e5, knight e5, knight b5, and let's say king e7. Now. Is this position obviously winning? I don't know. I don't know. So if I see this position from afar and I have a choice either to go to this position, which is, as I would say, probably winning, probably winning. I mean, yeah, I have two extra, uh, I mean, two pass pawns and while well, he's busy uh, attacking them at the queen side, I'll probably snatch the pawn on g4, but I'm not sure. I'm not 100% sure. So instead of this, I'll be seeking for something that I can put my uh, my hand on my heart and say, okay, this is this is something that I'm absolutely sure. Yep, yep, this is more complicated than the previous game, but this keeps the extra pawn, at least for the time being, right? In that position, we would sacrifice the pawn on e5, seemingly for nothing, but we are marching forward the pawn. So, some small nuances here, all right? All right, the next one. <clears throat> yeah, end games, call it sufficient. So end games, end games, end games, you have to know them. You have to know them, study the end games because, I mean, you wouldn't believe but the games very often they they tend to finish in the end games, right? So that's like, I don't know, learning how to drive and you don't know how to brake. <laughs> I mean, you need to know how to brake, right? Otherwise, it's gonna be a problem. So we have this position. Now the question is, how do we proceed here? I mean, I have an extra pawn. <laughs> yeah. I have an extra pawn here with Y. Mm -hmm. F4. Very quickly. F4. Now, before we are before we are on to the on to the correct answer, let me uh, let me uh, remind you where is a very important rule said by the great Mark Dvoretsky. So who is Mark Dvoretsky? Mark Dvoretsky 
He is a world-renowned, he was unfortunately, he already passed away, a world-renowned endgame expert. I mean, he was probably the most famous expert in endgames. Uh, he has written this amazing book, Mark Dvoretsky's Endgame, maybe, maybe it was without a mark, it was Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual. And he was explaining various concepts. So, if I'm looking at this position and I've studied the book, yeah, Carsten Müller, of course, is also very, very good in endgames. There's many, many experts. Also, Alexander Kalifman is, as far as I know, one of the greatest, one of the greatest experts in endgames. You just follow his Facebook discussions. I just want to shoot myself. I mean, so unbelievable, very uh, tricky endgames. So even me as a grandmaster, not always I, I understand them. So what, what said Vretsky? Vretsky said there is a rule. Yeah, none, of course, yeah. So Dvoretsky said, there is a rule. If you are the stronger side, let's say, what does it mean to be a stronger side? I mean, I'm playing with white. <laughs> it doesn't mean I'm the stronger side, but I have the extra pawn. Averbach, of course. Of course, Averbach. Yeah, it started with Averbach, I guess. So I'm playing with white, I have an extra pawn. The rule applies is that the stronger side is trading pieces. Now, this is important to remember. What does the weaker side? The weaker side is trading pawns. And by the way, this rule very often comes into force. It doesn't mean it always works. It doesn't mean, I mean, I've seen hundreds of examples where this rule is thrown out of the window. It simply doesn't work. What does it mean? It means it shows you something that you should be thinking about. So here I remember Doretsky's rule. If I'm the stronger side, I shouldn't trade pawns. Now, let's check a 4. F4 is seemingly illogical. Because I'm creating a passed pawn. Takes, takes. Takes, takes. Again, one of the most important things that Varetsky has, or maybe I'm exaggerating, but quite an important thing that Varetsky has said in his Endgame manual, <laughs> yeah, is that what is the easiest Endgame? The easiest of them all. I mean, maybe somebody will disagree, but it is, but it is like that. Yeah. Pawn Endgames. There is nothing easier. You can believe me. You disagree? You study some rook endgames, and then you'll see, then you'll see the difference. I mean, queen endgames, right? Crazy. In pawn endgames, unless you're really studying some very difficult pawn endgames, and believe me, yeah, there are very difficult pawn endgames. Sometimes I just look at them, I just, I just don't want to do them. I just don't want to do them, because one slight mistake, and you're just completely wrong. But the rule is this. Why are the pawn endgames the simplest? They're required to calculate you until something like 10. That's it. Can you calculate to 10? You should be able to calculate this, right? It's just me versus him. So obviously black is not going to play bishop takes in a 4. Because we have an outside pass pawn, the king is going to go to the queen side, collect the pawns, and we simply win the game. But the question is here. How easy is this position to win? I mean, I do understand in theory that probably I'll drop the pawn on g4 in order to penetrate the queen side. So let's say something like uh, knight e3, king goes here, king goes here, king c6. <coughs> should be winning. It should be somehow winning, because those pawns on a6 and b5, they draw. Let's go back. You know what's funny? f4 actually is winning. <laughs> but it is wrong. It is wrong according to Dvoretsky. And I would like to follow Dvoretsky's rule. And Varetsky said, if it is the simplest way to win this top on endgame. Yep, we play b4. Exactly. 
So let's say b4, he has no moves because king d5, he cannot allow that to happen. Bishop e7. Instead of knight e5, bishop b4, which probably is winning but maybe not so clear, knight c5 check. And about this position, I do understand your fear. You might think, wait a second, I mean, this is dangerous. I'm creating an outside pass pawn for my opponent. I mean, let me find something else. My answer would be, can you calculate to 10? <laughs> so that's it, just calculate to 10. Now, instead of the, uh, after b takes on c5, let's say b4, a5, king d7, and that's it. That's it. When you see this position after king c7 or a4, king d4, b3, a takes, a3, king c3, b4, king b3, those pawns are not getting anywhere. So king c7, king, b, king c4 wins, but even this position. And if you slightly study the pawn endgames, you know that two connected pawns will always take care of each other. So that's it. That's it. Your king will take care of that one passed pawn at the queen side. The king side will take care of themselves. So after g takes, e takes, something like... Yeah, I'm not even sure what to, what to propose here. b3, a3, here, and that's it. And that's you just take the pawn and nothing is even happening at the, at the king side because as soon as the black king is gonna come closer, obviously you're playing g5 or f5. And he couldn't take it. He couldn't take the pawn in the four because the other pawn is simply marching to queens. So that's it. Uh, there's a number of ways how to win the end game, but I believe this is the simplest. And having this knowledge of the Dvoretsky, Dvoretsky said the simplest are the pawn end games. Having this knowledge that the stronger side is trying to trade pieces, the weaker side is trying to trade pawns, it helps. It doesn't always apply, and it's quite paradoxical that f4 indeed would win. Yeah, no hurry in the endgames. I mean, I don't want to touch too much about the endgames, because today's topic is about converting material advantage, but I think it's one big topic. You cannot really take material advantage, so it's like, okay, so there's gonna be material advantage and there's gonna be endgames. <laughs> doesn't work like that. I mean, endgames often are part of the uh, converting the material advantage. You are taking this great position to an endgame because you know the endgame is winning. You have studied the endgames, you recognize them. So again, if you are sure, you take that position to the endgame, which you know that is winning. Let me show you more. So this actually was a more complex game, but I slightly um, reduced it. I left the final moves. So we have this position. White plays g4. When we look at this position, it should be quite apparent. Black should be winning. I mean, why not? I mean, we have three connect pass pawns at the queen side. But I'm slightly concerned about what's happening at the king side. Because I do see that there's g5 incoming. So instead, I could try to play... <laughs> I have very skilled chat, I see. So let's say I don't know what to do here. And I'm playing something like king h7. So I'm keeping my king away from the fork. So let's say white plays g5. I play something like rook c6. White plays check here, knight h5. I mean, it is still possible to misplay this, right? Of course, I do understand I'm going to push forward the b-pawn and probably even this position is winning. But what I want to mention, that part of the material, converting material advantage is 
simplify. We're simplifying the position and if you are okay to give away a part of material in order to make your life simpler, then you already understand just a lot better than other people. So G5, Knight H5, they're big threats. So we give away the exchange, exactly, as already mentioned in the chat. Rook takes on E4, Rook takes on E4. And remember yet another very important principle. Be patient. Always be patient. And this is something that is usually said to children. The children who are playing chess because they are impatient. I mean, they cannot be patient. I mean, they want to play, they want to push, they want to, they want to do something. It's just in their nature to play very quickly. And I still remember um, the advice from my first coaches. Sit on your hands. This was the technique. Sit on your hands. And the coaches, they, they say directly, just sit on your hands and put the hands under your legs and just sit. Because you physically cannot make the move, right? It's quite funny and probably it's used in other countries as well. But the idea is that what is threatening with rook f6 check? I mean, of course, we want to push the pawns forward. First, we make sure we are seeing everything our opponent is doing. King g7. Resignation immediately immediately this is a resignation for white the game stopped so this is my game I'm I, was, I'm I was playing it against another experienced player immediately the opponent realizes this game is finished so he has the exchange he has the passed pawn but why does he resign he has no hopes and like I mentioned it earlier part of converting material advantage is we convince our opponents it's it's hopeless your your case is hopeless right <coughs> and of course we want to finish the game as quickly as possible so if i have a winning position i have something like an extra piece do you really think i want to play for two hours <laughs> i want to take home the point as quickly as possible but if my opponent is playing it means definitely he's hoping for something so my job is try to convince him by most accurate moves, this is hopeless. By the way, the engines not always will agree with your decisions. Yeah, that's a practical way to win. All right, the next one. Next one is gonna be a little simple. <clears throat> So it's gonna be another rook endgame. Seemingly, it's somehow winning. But again, I think it's very important as soon as you get this position is you have a clear picture. Where do you want to move this position? It's not like you automatically execute some random moves and whatever happens, happens. I mean, you take a coin, you toss it. Oh yeah, okay, now I'm gonna make this move. So you should have a clear picture. Schematic thinking what I want to achieve here. The question is, what do you want to achieve here? I think it's quite simple. I want to trade one pawn, probably the g4 pawn for the e6 pawn, and I know, I know for sure that two connected pawns in a rook game they're winning. That's it. I just know this. I mean, I've studied end games. I know this. It's quite, quite a simple, a quite simple end game. So, that's what we do. G5. Attacking the pawn. I'm ready to trade it. King goes forward. 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 Here. So that's it. That's the way we trade them. I'm offering the pawn on G6. Now instead of this, you know it's so easy to misplay this. So let's say I don't know this rule. I don't know what I'm doing here. And instead, I'll play something like, you know, that e6 pawn is bothering me. So I'll play something like king h3. King h3, here, and f5. That's a draw. This is a theoretical draw. So you cannot win this already. It's so easy to misplay this if you don't have a schematic thinking. 
Now, after g6, of course, the opponent is not going to take it because he also knows, he also knows this is winning position. So he'll try to make it as difficult for you as possible. He is hoping for something. There is no hope for after king takes on g6. King f6, g7, I'm very happy still to trade it. Yeah, they, they are thinking about swindles as well. Rook g5, here, and that's it. That's it. King f3, resignation. Because the pawn endgame is easily winning. After takes, takes, takes. We transpose the position from a rook endgame with two extra pawns to a winning pawn endgame with just one extra pawn. Of course, I still need to know some basic knowledge about the opposition. The question is, am I sure? Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure I'm gonna win this. So I double check this line after king e4, king f6, g4, whatever he does, it doesn't matter. Let's say he plays here, here, here. I still know the rule of the opposition. This is obviously something I'll never do because I immediately recognize this is a draw. I've studied end games again. Now instead, g5, g6 king e6 is an easy winning pot end game that's why we study them all right <clears throat> now let me show you a slightly more complex example this is a full game this is a whole game and uh, it's my game i was playing it against uh, uh, Vladimir Fedosev some years ago I think it was four years ago a rapid tournament and um, opponent made a mistake for some reason he played e6 I don't know he missed something he miscalculated something he hallucinated something it doesn't matter yeah so e6 knight c6 around here he realized that knight b6 is incoming Knight b6, queen d6, oh my goodness, I've blundered the pawn. So, b takes on c6, knight b6, rook b8, queen d6. I simply collected an extra pawn. Thank you, Lasan. Knight d7. Now the question. Now the question is. What should we be thinking about here? Is this already the moment to think about converting the material advantage? So white has an extra pawn, black's position is shattered. Obviously black is still playing because he is hoping for something. He didn't blunder a piece, he blundered the pawn. <clears throat> now the first thing. I want to take the pawn on c6. I want to take on c6. Yeah, I want to take it. But after rook b6, queen, uh, bishop b6, queen b6, queen b6, knight b6. Why should we be happy about this position? Yeah, of course, everybody already sees this. Yep, yeah, I just wanted to mention. But queen b8 is a great moment to simplify the position. Exactly. So knight c4 also is a possibility but it keeps many pieces on the board i want to simplify the position after queen b8 knight b8 rook d8 rook d8 now so straight from the opening we are already in the technical phase of the game white has the extra pawn and now comes a very important moment um uh, now this is coming from me, I'm a grandmaster myself, and I've used this many, many occasions, is that many people, they don't know which pieces to trade. So at this moment, um, let's say I'm playing against a much weaker player, and I made a mistake. I mean, this happens. I mean, I blundered, I... I was thinking about something else. I was thinking about my boot cap, whatever. So I didn't pay attention to the game and I just blundered the pawn. 
So one of the most trickiest techniques that experienced players are usually using, they're offering not good trades. And if I am playing against, let's, I'm not talking about myself, I'm imagining myself being an amateur player, I'm playing against professional, I just want to pawn. So I want to trade as many pieces as possible, as many, as many, as many, as many pieces as possible, because then I would take it closer to the end game. Uh, this is where real paradoxical thing starts. I was raised in my youth that if you win something extra in an opening, <coughs> oh, there's a raid. For some reason, it didn't drop out. Oh, there it is. Hey, Chess Dojo, how are you doing? Hello, hello, hello. How are you doing? Who is it? Who is it, David? Jesse? Who is it? How are you doing? Jesse sends his love. Oh my goodness, I need it. I need it. Thank you, thank you. Uh, this is Latvian Grandmaster Arthur Nexus. So appreciate for your raid. I mean, you're wonderful. I mean, I would probably give you a shout out, but I mean, everybody already knows who you are, right? So that is the amazing Chess Dojo trio. And I'm um, very, 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 very happy for your raid. I've watched some of your streams lately. I'm very happy for you. I didn't watch your stream today, but uh, you are my example. You are my example how I want to stream. So very, very happy for your raid. Again, thank you. What I'm doing here today is I'm organizing a bootcamp. Bootcamp is a training camp, training session, training stream about something educational, something very, very smart. So today I'm talking about converting material advantage. So that is my big, big topic today. I hope you're gonna like it. I hope, hope you had a great stream yourself and just take the best seats here, take some popcorn and I hope you enjoy it really. Yeah, again, thank you and <laughs> please stay here. Alrighty, alrighty, so that was Jesse. Yeah, Jesse is an amazing, amazing, amazing person. And uh, yeah, of course, welcome every, every ready here. Uh, this is my bootcamp number 23. And like I said, today we're talking about converting material advantage. So this game is my game. I really like to show my games, right? Uh, this is my game against uh, Vladimir Fedoseyev in rapid tournament. Um, I think it was 2017, I don't want to lie. I think it was 2017. He was already very strong grandmaster. And uh, Black just blundered. He just blundered the pawn. And I was explaining what is the best way here to proceed. And I started to explain that experienced grandmasters or players, they offer not good trades. And what you can learn from here is you don't rush trading. You don't rush trading. I mean, always think, does this benefit to you? Now, the first question here, if we want to simplify the position, first question, do we take on C8? Because that would simplify the position, right? Knight C8, I, ca I can show it to you. After Knight C8, Rook C8, I could play something like... I mean, the pawn on A6 is weak. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I could play, let's say, bishop a7 because, oh, there's that pawn. There's that pawn on a6. Let's say a5. Bishop b6, something like a4. Bishop e2. Should be winning. Should be winning, right? Oh, just a second. Yeah, so this was the position. <coughs> but instead, I'm thinking... How can actually black untangle his position? So my knight on b6 is a very annoying piece. Instead, I think I can continue development of my other pieces. So now after bishop e2, we want to play rook d1. We are not missing any tactical tricks with bishop b2, rook d1. Keep that in mind. This is why we are doing the puzzles. Bishop b7, rook d1, black simply doesn't have any choice. I mean, you cannot give up the d-file. Takes, bishop d1, bishop e5. Now, in this position, I want to make as less 
uh, big decisions as possible. So g3 would make some weaknesses at the king's side. If I play h3, I think he will be unable to use my weak and dark squares, so I'm playing h3. Bishop c7. Now, the question is, how do we proceed from here? How do we play here? So I don't need desperately try to trade every single piece, although this is what the Vreski said, right? I mean, if you are the stronger player, if you are the dominating side, you want to trade pieces. Trade a dark square bishop. Yeah, that is a good idea, SPG, but how do you do that? How do you want to do that? Do you think your opponent will allow that? He is also experienced a Grandmaster, so he is probably going to organize some kind of a counterplay. And now, if I already know this in advance, that my opponent is experienced, he blundered it, where is his counterplay gonna be? Probably a 5. Probably a 5, he's gonna try to do something in the center. I could try to bring the king closer to the action. Something like king d2, king c3, etc. But ultimately, it's very important to imagine yourself in your head the picture. What you're supposed to do here, what will be your plan here. If you have that picture, if you know what you are drawing, it's going to be much, much easier. So I think it's quite obvious. We have an extra pawn at the queen side. So we push forward the pawns at the queen side. Because once a true race will start, we'll already have a head start. A4. Just push them. A4, B4, maybe C3. Then you can bring the king closer. A5. Improving the bishop. F takes. Yeah, maybe here one moment. <coughs> After f5, there was this moment. Should I take on f5 myself? Or should I allow the opponent to take on e4? I'm trying to avoid any unclear... I mean, any counter chances for my opponent. Yeah, but he also will have an isolated pawn on e6. I mean, the point is, he wants to take, he wants to push e5, e4 and create a passed pawn. Maybe it's not a big deal. Probably this is also very much playable. Now, instead of this, I think bishop e2 is just more secure. Now, after the capture, capture c5. Black simply doesn't have a choice because the question is how do you bring the queen side pieces into the game? I mean they're stuck there and obviously he wants he wants to bring them into the game so bishop b6 is an ugly do ugly choice bishop b6 bishop b6 97 I just go back bishop e3 and oh my goodness I mean what is this what is this position so that's why he is trying to bring the pieces into the game and now he plays c5 effectively trading the pawn on c5 with the pawn on e4 now, let me tell you a little secret. I allow this to happen. Why is that? Because I know my opponent's mindset. He is thinking about where is my counterplay. So he's definitely going to try to change something what is happening in the game. So I'll, I allow him to take on e4. I allow him to play c5. Why is that? Because this forces trades trades which are in my favor now after bishop f3 we force yet another trade yeah the bishop is traded trade trade and about this position we have two pawns which are effectively blocking black's three pawns so what i've got out of this position i've traded a couple of pieces and now I have two connected pass pawns at the queen side. I've managed to transpose my position 
from point A to maybe not, I'm not sure what is the other point, I guess not point B, but point D, whatever, to point B already. So this is a big step. So black played knight c6, knight c4 goes back because I want to push forward the pawns. I cannot do it immediately. I cannot play immediately b4 because I just dropped the pawn. So that's why we retreat and also at the same time we watch out our opponent's intentions. He wants to play knight e5, he wants to go after the pawns on f3 and h3. I've always believed that the best way to play this is execute your own plan and with one hand try to kick off your opponent's counter chances, but don't forget looking for them. So after knight c4, king f7, b4, bishop f4, king goes here, e5, b5, trade, trade. Now the position has even more simplified. Now we have created two connected pass pawns at the queen side. And black simply cannot play knight e4. He cannot play knight e4 because this will allow me to trade one of his most unpredictable pieces. So let's something like bishop takes on d4, takes on d4, king e2, king e6, king, I guess, king d3, king goes here, knight a5. This should be easily winning position. So instead, <clears throat> instead he plays knight e8. Now, why is he playing? Why my opponent is still playing here? I mean, both of us, we do understand the position is tactically winning. This means he is still hoping for something. The question is, what is he hoping for? And this is a very, very important question. It's very important for me to find an answer. What does he want to play here? How I would play here against myself? What do you think? Outpost. Yeah, but what about g5? 96, 9g5. <clears throat> Remember what I said. Sometimes positional gains are more important than the number of pawns or the material situation. I mean, he already is probably technically lost. I mean, how many times can he lose the game? If he is an experienced player, he'll probably try to complicate. He'll never be sitting in a passive defense because passive defense History shows it doesn't hold. You want to check how the history, how the passive defense was doing? You can check games of 100 years history. I mean, they simply don't hold. I don't think you have still got the idea what he really wants. I think so, what he wants. I'm, I'm not sure what he wants. I think according to my understanding. Let me make a random move. And I'll show you the idea what he wants. Let's say I play King E2. Who can play King E2? It's a seemingly normal looking move. I think so. I think so. This was his idea. Maybe not right away, but this idea must have been his idea. So let's say after F takes, something like G5, we want to play H5. Let's say I don't know what's happening here. I'm focusing on my pawn h5, b6, g4, h takes, h4. He's trying to complicate the game as much as he can because he can lose it only once and he'll try to organize some kind of a counterplay. So I'm thinking if I'm playing from the black's perspective, I would do this. I would absolutely do this. Just sacrifice yet another pawn, organize outside pass pawn and hope for a miracle because passive defense is not gonna hold. Now we know this, we know the idea. We know the idea for our opponent. So what do we do? We stop it. 
we make a profit lactive move and we simply stop it. Knight e6 check, king e6 and c4. He cannot play e4 anymore and even worse, he has no access to knight b7. It's very very important, don't push the solo pawn alone. Don't push the b-pawn without the help of the other pawn. Be patient. Just be patient. Take small steps at a time and many many people there are impatient. So here after c4, king e6, knight e4, knight e6, bishop is rerouted, preparing to play c5, c6, bishop g5, seeking some kind of a counterplay. And I think I actually here I made the sole mistake. The sole mistake in the game. I don't think I even saw it. I could have played right away. Simplifying the position. After knight c5, bishop c5, I guess e4 is the last practical chance. Because otherwise, the white king goes here, the bishop goes here, and the pawns are simply marching forward. And black will be just sitting and watching. Just sitting and watching how he is being outplayed. So of course. Of course, he'll be seeking some kind of a counterplay. So after e4, f takes something like bishop f4, g5. I believe this should be still something like this. Should be still quite easily winning. I didn't see knight c5. So this was a rapid game after all. c5. C, uh, yeah, I think it was king c2 first. Now the question again is, what do we do with the pawn on h3? Now this is a very very important question. Do we defend it? What do we do with it? Do we push to h4? Do we make some counter attack? What do we play here? So when you get to this position, and again this is sometimes what takes away important attention you have to understand and answer yourself how important is the pawn on h3 when you are marching forward two connected pawns on the queen side completely irrelevant it simply doesn't matter why did my opponent play this what else to do for him, right? So he is seeking some kind of ways to confuse me, trying to complicate the game. Obviously he knows as well. The pawn on h3 doesn't matter, but you have to do something. So we just give it away. After c6, king c7, knight c3 is a yet another way how we reroute pieces to better locations. So let's say after knight takes on h3, I believe there's already a number of ways how you can win this position. So let's say knight e5 check, king d6, there's bishop c5. That should be easily winning. The point being c7 is promoting. But even a move like uh, a move like um, knight e7 should be easily winning as well. King e7, b6, b7, bishop a7. And the same applies for knight f2, b6. And one of the pawns is going to advance and the knight on f2 is simply shut out of the game and again the question is does it really matter if black has this pawn on h7 one two three four five i have one two in a pawn race that's completely irrelevant but still i do understand a lot of people who are concerned because yeah because they simply uh no what's this noise so, so they think simply don't think about the schematic thinking push forward the pawns at the queen side and don't think about such small things as this irrelevant pawn at the king side so the game finished very quickly with bishop g3 simplifying simplifying again more tricks and inevitably inevitably position was already hopeless at this moment opponent understands that's it i mean that's it i have no more chances i mean i tried my best i tried to organize the past pawn 
it didn't work, it's time to stop the clock. So until this moment, he plays. Alright. Now the next one, no tricks available. Exactly. So everybody plays until the last trick. <laughs> yeah. It hurts to be, I mean, it's, it's dead lost. I mean, it happens. So, now what? Now I'm gonna show you the next technique. And this next technique is something that many people don't even think about when converting the material advantage. So what is this amazing resource that not everybody is using? It's actually pretty simple. It's the so-called play for the checkmate. I call it play for the checkmate bonus. What does it mean? Let me show you some examples. Yeah, I played good today. Um, let me show... I have several examples. Let's say I'll start with this one. So yeah, this is the position. <clears throat> now, or maybe I should I should go back a move and start from here. Let's imagine we have this position. There was slight inaccuracy. This is why I thought about skipping it. We're thinking about wait. I mean, we are obviously having a great position with white. So black has those weak queenside pawns the pawn on c5 is weak the pawn on a6 is weak the black square is vulnerable to king side <coughs> yeah but why cannot we try to win the pawn immediately because i mean everybody is greedy everybody wants to take the pawn if they see one so let me try to take one let's say rook a6 immediately doesn't work tactically so c4 dropping the access to the rook and after queen d6 now this should be a drop okay didn't work i'll try to play queen takes on b5 queen takes on b5 takes on b5 and rook b6 now this is my idea i'm gonna win a pawn a rook b8 i'll just take it so let's say b4 rook b5 activating the rook uh something like rook c5 captures captures rook d2 e3 captures here here and here now the question is is this winning i don't know i don't know i'll tell you honestly i tell you honestly i don't no, I don't know. I mean, I see this position from afar. There is this possibility to go for this position. Can I win this? Maybe I go here. <laughs> Thank you, Papa Magin, for your donation. Appreciate that. I like the I like this uh, gift. <laughs> right, appreciate that. So I don't know. And <clears throat> as I already explained in the beginning, I try not to go for a position which is good. I mean in the end game, but I'm not sure if that is winning. If I have something else, I'll go here if I have nothing better. Does it make sense? Let's go back. Let's go back to this position. So we have this position and we just were considering to take the pawn on b5. The first to blink? <laughs> I'm not sure. Now. I think my humble opinion is that the pawn on a6 and c5, they won't go anywhere. They won't go anywhere. Now, this is very, very important to understand. I mean, you want to take the pawn. You can always do that. Because your opponent, let's imagine he's a skilled player. He is looking for ways to try to complicate the game. Now, I'm looking towards the king side. I just noticed my opponent play g6 and I'm thinking, can I try to use this? 
Can I try to use this to my advantage? Yeah, rook c4 is a good point. I mean, in the game it was actually first h4, and now it was rook c4. Although, rook c4 right away it was possible. The question is, how should black try to meet this h5 threat? Because I am threatening with h5. How do you play here? h5 immediately? Whoops. I think this is easily winning now. After the take. I'm sorry. F takes. Take. Take. Now, if this is not the mate, I don't know what this is. Alright, this should be an easy mate. Two heavy pieces are uh, checkmating. Delivering a checkmate against an exposed, completely exposed king. Now, what to do for black? Queen a5, attacking the pawn on a4, rook a4, check, here. The pawn on a6 now is under attack. And by the way, it's very important. Now I'm threatening to take the pawn on a6. I still keep the queens on the board. Now that is that is a major difference to that end game that we had before. Now I have a lot of targets. I have the targets on a6. I have the target on c5, and I'm still thinking about potential h4, h5, try to get to the black king. Now, after a5, h5, we open the white at the black king. Queen a1. The question here again is, quite an interesting one by the way, is this winning? h takes, h takes, rook e6. And this is something definitely one should be calculating. Because after f takes, queen e6, queen g7, queen e6, queen f7, rook g4, king h7. I saw this from afar, but I'm not sure. I mean, I didn't calculate until then. This was a rapid game after all. I didn't calculate. I had a feeling. I had a feeling this should be winning, and it is winning. Indeed, it is winning with right checks. This is easily winning, but from afar, it wasn't very obvious. But queen e4 is also a good move, good move to stop black from playing queen e5. Rook d8, obviously black is finally seeking some activity. And again, this is what I told you about every single experienced player in a passive position will be looking for counterplay. Because imagine this position from the black perspective. He has the weakness on a5. He has the weakness on c5, and plus you're attacking at a king side. The queen on a1 doesn't do anything, so he is trying to do what I call sell a pawn. I call this, he is selling the pawn on a5. And again, many inexperienced players are doing like this. They're seeing a pawn, there's a... Oh, <laughs> Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, let me take a pawn. I'm winning a pawn against the Grammaster, right? I mean, let me trade some pieces so that I can finally try to take this pawn. They don't realize that his opponent is trying to trick him. He is selling him this pawn. He is trying to force not good trades. Now the point is, after rook d8, rook d8, I'm thinking, okay, now I'm gonna simplify the position. I'm gonna take h takes, h takes, rook a5. And then suddenly after rook, d1 oh wait oh wait i mean this is not so simple right oh wait there's there's some checks and then they lose the control of the game and in the end the experienced player actually wins the game having come from this terrible position which was in the middle game it's unthinkable but this happens all the time now the trade is okay the trade is okay rook d8 is okay rook d8 we can still play for the mate even though if you are not really threatening with it the following move h6 is a big big annoyance for black because he can never play rook d1 there's gonna be a checkmate the pawns on a5 and c5 they're still weak remember what i told you in the beginning they're not going anywhere they're just staying there you can pick them up at the right moment. You might ask yourself, wait a second, I mean, what about the pawn on h6? Am I not gonna lose it? Wait a second, yeah, I think, I think you're gonna lose it, but 
if you're going to lose it, you're going to trade it. You're going to transpose this pawn, this endgame. You're, you're going to give up the pawn on h6 for the pawn on a5 with the pawn on c5. Hello, code future. Insane lesson, meaning it's very difficult? I hope it's not very difficult. I'm trying to explain trying to explain very very simple language but I mean if, if something is very difficult I mean you can ask me questions I mean I'm all for it if something is not clear just ask me just ask me any questions I'll gladly answer if there are not too many of them just don't ask me please how can I become better at chess because I get these questions every single time thank you Arikido thank you so Queen C1 white is I'm sorry black is attacking the pawn on H6 we can take the pawn on a5. It's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. E3. The pawns on c5 and a5, they remain. And this is what we call the patience. We are patient. I mean, it's, again, very quickly to misplay this. Let's say, oh, there's a pawn on a5. I'm quickly grabbing it. Queen h6, rook c5. Oh my goodness, this is so great, this is so great. And then, boom suddenly it's not so easy because because there's some kind of a threat queen h1 i already have to play something else i mean okay they're technically still winning yeah luckily luckily this is still winning but i just wanted to show you that in some yeah it's it's still winning i wanted to show you that not always it ends so happily we want to be patient the pawns on a5 pawns on c5 they're not going anywhere so now after queen c3 Rook c4. Now, around here already, this should be quite apparent. Black's position is falling apart completely because he cannot keep no longer both weaknesses on a5, on c5, and the checkmate threat. This is what I call the bonus for the checkmate. And if you like it, I can mention this that this actually fits very well what said Aaron Nimtsevich about 100 years ago and he was the first one I believe so who said it that if your opponent has one weakness you make another and you press on them both because it's not enough to have just one weakness I mean you can pressure it he's always going to defend it so you have one weakness at the king side create another at the queen side and try to press them both and it's gonna be very very difficult for him to defend them both now there is a there is a joke of course which was said by my friend another GM who said it's enough with one weakness because the second weakness is your opponent right <laughs> and okay I mean you can try to believe that but I still try to rely on the uh, classical knowledge yeah, sometimes yeah the opponent of course is a big weakness but uh, you could always rely on that so after queen f6, rook c5, g5, rook a5, we collect the pawns on c5 and a5. And now after queen h6, also the g5 pawn falls. And the final phase of transposing the advantage is that after king f8, we give a check here, take it, take it, take it. And that's it. And that's it a4 rook b5 push forward push forward the king side completely doesn't matter you already know the technique if you have studied this the pawn chain with the help of the rook is easily winning this position so we started to play this position with a bonus for the checkmate did we checkmate in then we did not checkmate we simply use this as an instrument try to get something more many people forget this i'll show you more examples so that you have a better understanding of this principle um the next game is going to be actually this is not my game actually so the next game is going to be of fabi caruana was playing with white against uh, <clears throat> Who was it? Yu Yangui. So we have this position. Yu Yangui is playing with black. Fabi Caruana is playing with white. Fabi has the extra pawn. Should be winning, right? Somehow. But please pay attention 
to the weakened pawns at, at the queen side. They're very weak. So let's say I'll try to trade the queen somehow. Let's imagine, let's imagine if that is even possible. Let's say I'll play queen e6 check, king goes here. I'll play queen b3 here. And let's say c takes on b3. The question is, is this winning? Or maybe instead of the queen b3, I'll try to play queen e6 check, king g7, queen e5, queen e5, rook e5. The question is, is this enough? Is this enough? And Fabi obviously knows this. He's thinking about this. No, it's not enough. I already can tell you this is not enough. Why is that? Why is that? There's some weaknesses. You know, the engine actually says this is equal. This is equal. So let's say Black will play something like Rook C8, Rook F2, Rook C3, Rook F, Rook F7, Rook C7, Rook A3. Black is seriously pressure, pressing those weaknesses. Let's go back. Fabi obviously knows this. This shouldn't be winning. If there is one chance he could try to get something out of this position, it's bonus for the checkmate. That's it. I mean, that's it. I mean, he has to try to checkmate because the black king is slightly weakened and he'll try to open the position, try to trick his opponent and Whatever happens, happens. He is not gonna trade queens. He'll never trade queens. Despite the fact that his own king is weak. And this is quite paradoxical. Because, let's say, I'm thinking from another point of view. I'm thinking about, my king is weak. What should I do? The logical answer is, trade queens. So I play queen e6, I play queen e5, I'm trading. Okay, now I'm gonna think. <laughs> this is too late. This is a little thing because you already blew your chance. Yes, your king is weak, but so is uh, so is black's uh, king as well. White might be losing to an experienced player. Yeah, yeah, sure. So rook b3. So Fabi was slowly advancing forward, securing the king, avoiding the queen trade. And there was one critical moment. So he is looking for some kind of a way to get to the black king. Hello, Didia. The point being, g takes on the 5 probably is going to be a mate. Queen g5 check, something like here, rook d8 check, here, here. Now, this should be a win. Now, this should be a win because white, quite unexpectedly, has started a deadly attack. So, Fabi is trying to play for the mate. Queen e5 check, king g2, here, here. Trading rooks. It's okay. Trade rooks is okay because this keeps the chances alive to deliver actual mate against the black king. Trading queens is most likely going to transpose to a drone endgame or rook endgame. So here after king f3, rook e7, a critical moment arose here. Fabi made a slight mistake. He played rook d5. Queen d3 was simply a better choice. Here, here. Now, the question is, why you young Gui didn't trade queens? When I saw this, I was flabbergasted. I mean, why? Why on earth you wouldn't want to trade queens? Because do you really expect that you're going to hold this position with an exposed king, which is targeted by two heavy pieces? You always need to be careful not to miss, let's say, a losing pawn endgame. But actually it's more tricky than this. So after queen e3 check, captures, captures, king f4, rook takes an h3, check, check, and now, now comes the fun part. After the check, king f8, a, f takes on g6. Would you believe this? h6 is the way to go. <laughs> And even if he sees this position from afar, can you tell that this is a draw? I mean, this is this is an incredibly difficult moment. Um, I think it's very easy to miss this, especially if you're calculating a variation. When you have no choice and you get to this position. Yeah, so 
h takes actually is losing because rook a7 king g5 king g6 we simply reach what i call a triangle in the rook's endgame which inevitably transposes to a bridge so that's it with the pawn on h6 black is implying that these pawns they don't matter and he needs to take of these take care of these pawns and then somehow with the pawn on g4 and pawn on g6 black draws is it obvious <laughs> no it's not obvious. I mean, when I saw this, I was, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So this is how uh, super GMs make mistakes. So instead, what Yu Yangui did, he didn't trade queens. And I'm pretty sure that Fabi was expecting this. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I mean, from afar, not very obvious. So uh, Yu Yangui played King G7, Rook D6. He was pressing for the attack and finally, finally, around here Yu Yangui simply faltered he faltered so after queen h6 here check here check oh, i'm sorry yeah rook d7 let's play for the mate and now we transpose to pawn endgame because that was our goal from the start i mean we wanted to go to the pawn endgame we didn't want the rook endgame we want to go to the pawn endgame because i explained in the beginning beginning of the boot camp Pawn end games, they're the simplest end games there is. If you have the opportunity, go for the pawn end game because very often you need to count to 10. If you can count to 10, <laughs> just go for the pawn end games. Queen g5, trade, trade, g takes. That's it. Resignation. So I guess the game could have continued something like a5 a3 a4 h4 and the king has to move yeah, king has to move thus fabi uh, play the ga great game um another very similar example let me show you <clears throat> this time it's gonna be my game so we have this position I can remember we're talking about the bonus play for the checkmate. I mean, you think what checkmate? I mean, what are you talking about? What kind of checkmate? First, I'll start with a question. If we are going to trade queens, are you sure you're going to win this? Now, this is a very, very important question because I could find, I could try, I could find a way to trade queens. Are you sure? Me neither. I'm not sure. Because the rook endgame, two versus two at the queen side, three versus two at the king side. Pawn endgame? Sure. Pawn endgame absolutely is winning. Rook endgame? Not sure. Alright. The next question. Can we trade queens? Uh, I'm sorry, can we trade rooks? Can we go for the rook end, uh the queen endgame? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know. I mean, can I trade rooks? So again, this is what I told you about. Never in endgames go for positions where you're not sure, especially from the dominating position. So this is very, very important. If you have the dominating position, your opponent is sitting and waiting because that's all he can do. He can just sit and wait. Now, all that matters is your technique, how you're going to crash through yeah queen endgames are even worse probably i mean rook games rook endgames they're difficult queen endgames they're difficult queen c6 is potentially a threat that black could try to make and now we are remembering about this little thing called bonus for the checkmate i'm thinking about this so if i'm not sure if i can trade queens if i'm not sure that i can trade rooks what else is there i'm thinking can I try to expose the black king? Open some lines so that I can try to create some threats and then trade either the queen or the rook? That's a great idea. It's a great practical idea. So we are playing rook e5, rook e5, and g4. 
We're playing g4, g5. Black is waiting. A g5. And now black has a very big question. What are you going to do here? So let's say I'm sitting and waiting. Let's say something like rook c8. I can already take it. I'm exposing the, the black king. Queen takes on h6, drops the game immediately. So this was the purpose why we did this. No, 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 no. We are opening the position. If he takes, g takes on h6. Now I can already think about some potential mating ideas against the black king. Again, I'm using this bonus for the checkmate in order to provoke something. It doesn't mean I'm always going to checkmate my opponent. Now, this is very, very important to understand. So that's a part of the technique that many people are simply not using or they, ju they just don't know it. So after g5, h takes, h takes, a g6 is impossible because of rook f6. Queen e6, and now I'm thinking about how? Yeah, bonus for the checkmate. Yeah, did I say something wrong? Bonus for the checkmate. Now, uh, oh, sorry, checkmate as a bonus. <laughs> checkmate as a bonus. Yeah, I was keeping saying wrongly, I guess. Checkmate as a bonus. Checkmate as a bonus. Everybody silently understood. I hope. I hope. <laughs> yeah, my mistake. So I'm thinking here, how can I play g6? g6 with the idea to play queen h5, queen h3, and try to get to the king with queen h7. Now first fix the queen side. Rook f4 with the idea to play rook g4. Since my opponent was so skilled, he immediately recognized what I'm doing here. He knew the technique that I'm using. And he understood now it's the time to trade queens unfortunately i cannot transpose to the queen endgame i would love to i would love to play rook f8 check i hope you're seeing this by the way because trade is queen takes on d5 black drops the queen uh king h7 i take it and the problem is the problem is queen takes on g5 and this is ouch. Now this is an ouch moment. It's very, very easy to miss this. That's a check. Black collects back the, uh, the, po the, the rook on the 8 and wins back the pawn. But the point being, if this check was impossible, after take, queen f5 check, king g8, g6. Now this was the dream position that I was aiming for. I'm exposing the black king, and now I'm threatening with, for example, queen e6, queen h3, queen h7, queen h8, etc. And if at some moment the opponent, let's say he is totally desperate, he's trading queens, we remember, I'm not even obliged to checkmate you. It is just a technique to force good trades so that I can already go to a winning pawn endgame. Takes, takes, f4, f5. King of three, here, 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 here. King d5, king e6, and king e5. Okay, that was that was slightly more difficult. I guess I could have done it easier, right? But again, you have to understand we're using this in order to score a full point to get from the point e, which is having something extra to the moment when the opponent is already stopping the clock. In the game, something else happens, so it's not really so relevant. I just wanted to show you this idea that we played the rook endgame and the opponent collapsed uh, very quickly. Yeah. Alright. Um, another one of my favorite examples is this position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. It was it was an easy one. I just wanted to show you, use this as an example that is possible to transpose the advantage for something to something else. So we have this position. White has the extra pawn. Now I'm talking about 
Yeah, I won the last game. I won the last game. Rucksack on d7. Remember, where is this bonus play for the mate? Where is it? Do you see it? Not very obvious. Uh, I'll start with this. First, black is threatening with a 4. Try to do something here. We have the opposite card bishop endgame, potentially. So, one rook could go away if we trade another rook. With the opposite card bishop endgame, there is quite a big chance that... Yeah, king of eight. Yeah, king of eight, by the way, is a threat. Yeah, that is a very, very, very good point. Yeah, first we bring it to d6. First we bring it to d6 so that there is no king of eight. So rook e8 is impossible because takes takes. We simply snatch the pawn on a5. Rook c8, bishop d6. Now comes the tricky part. After a4, if black would be seeking ways to activate his uh, queenside uh, pawn. So we play b4. We play b5, threatening to play b6, b7, and any a3. I can already play rook e to e3. Now this should be a winning position. So I give up the extra pawn in order to move my own. Now this is the moment and again when a lot of people have trouble to adjust. So they're thinking they're very materialistic. Oh, he's attacking my pawn, I should be defending it. So, black played a4, let me just try to defend it somehow. I don't know, maybe... I'm not even sure how to defend it. Let's say b takes on a4, rook a4, a3, rook a8, and the question is... How do you even play here for the win? The pawn on a3 most likely is going to fall. Maybe not even right away, but... It's not moving anywhere. So you kept the pawn. But you lost all of your chances to play for the win. Yeah, okay, maybe there's some c6 at the moment, but I just wanted to show you this idea that this greed, trying to keep the material at all costs, it can seriously backfire. Positional gains very often are more important than just the one pawn. Now, rook a6, threatening to play rook takes on d6, we go away, rook e3 h5 h5 is already the first sign now when my opponent played here h5 i'm thinking wait a second wait a second i can try to get to the black king because he just made h5 in order to fight for some space i mean otherwise i would play g4 myself but first it's very important to remember be patient play prophylactic chess and you cannot always play like looking back behind the shoulder. You need to make sure that a4 is not going to be a threat. h3 is good. h4 maybe not so much. But black is gonna play a4 at any moment. First, deal with that problem. First, deal with that. Rook e4. Rook a4. One problem fixed. By the way, the rook on a4 is also going to take care of the king side as well because I can very easily play rook a4, rook h4, and do something there immediately. It's not a passively positioned rook. Also, at the same time, I avoid any rook trades because rook e8 here. I'll just take it. I'll just take it and snatch the second pawn. I'm already happy. Yeah, and the king is gonna move, definitely. H3. King goes here. King goes here. King H6. So, the idea was to play king G5. Position the king on F6. Let us let me make some random moves. Uh, I don't know, here, here, here. Um, I don't know, maybe... How should I play here? I don't know, F4, here, here. Ideally, something like this. Um, I'm not even sure how to do that. I guess f5, g takes rook h4. Rook h5, bishop e5, and there should be some sort of a mate on h8. I mean, that's just an idea. 
Yeah, okay, if I would be playing this game at this moment, of course, I would be seeking for some ways to try to get to the Black King. And what is in interesting here, this is a piece. The King is a piece. It is actually a piece. It is taking care of some of the most important, okay, not on G8, uh, some of the most important squares that his opponent, my opponent's King, could try to take. So that's why. So that's why Black was trying to block it, not to allow to go to g5. Now we play f4, threatening at some moment to play g4. Rook goes here. Now, the question is, how many of you here would play g4? I mean, I just said it. I just said you should play g4. How many of you would co actually consider this? So the point is, we always need to be aware what our opponent wants. Why did he play rook h8? Start with this. Was it a random move? What do you think? I just played a 4. I just played a 4. And he randomly played rook h8. Oh, no, no. G4, f5 is going to be g5, mate. Oh, you mean for white? G4, f5. Why did he position the rook on h8? So after g4. Yes, he wants the h file. But he's going to play g5. Not king moves. King g6. And maybe he even won't take the pawn on g5. Does it matter? He'll probably activate it and then activate another rook. And maybe you'll be so shocked with the turn of events, you'll even get checkmated. Rook h8, rook h3. I've seen it in worse games. And I passed pawn. So we pay attention. We pay attention to what is happening here. And you cannot be overly excited about your ideas. Although it is a dominating position. Now, this is a very interesting moment. There is a forced way. So we started from point A. So imagine we have a journey. We have a journey from the point A to the point, I don't know, point G, whatever. Okay, not G, H, point H, whatever. So we got it to the point B, we got it to the point C, got it to the point D. Now the question is, what is the next step? Because we want to play for the mate. Our opponent is ready. Is ready to meet g4. f5, g takes on f5 doesn't do any good. a3, b4. Forget it. We have not. No, 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 no. We have nothing to do there. You don't want to open the queen side. Queen side is fixed. We have a weakness on a5. You conquer the weaknesses. You don't trade them. That is the rule. Win the pawn on a5. Don't trade it. Think about terms like that. Now, remember the principle. Bo uh, checkmate as a bonus. Yeah, this time I said correctly, I apologize. I was saying number of times wrongly. Checkmate as a bonus. How many of you can spot that the Black King is actually in the mating net? Bishop b5? No, no. He is actually in the mating net. It's not a very obvious moment. But the king on h6 stops the white king from advancing to g5. But still, there is a forced way to make a mating net. Transpose the game from to the next point. Yes, very good, Mieras. Rook e4. Very good. Rook e4 and rook e6 is incoming. What do you do here? So... Rook e4, we want to sacrifice an exchange on e6, and black is completely powerless. How do you play here? So a4, of course, of course, now he is doing this. I mean, he has to try. I mean, he understands that this is otherwise game over. Yeah, this is not easy. It's always difficult to spot unorthodox ideas, and this is unorthodox idea. So a4... We play rook e6. 
F takes on E6, it would be exactly the same after D takes on E6 as well. And now the funny part is, before... <laughs> yeah, you're not seeing the mate, that is a good point. You're not seeing the mate, because there is not one at, at the beginning. But the Black King is in the mating net. We transpose the possession. Rook takes on D7, we create a passed pawn. And the Black King is in the mating net. This is something we can use it. We are using checkmate as a bonus to force our opponent to make some more committal decisions. Yes, g5 is going to be a sack at some time. a takes, a takes, g5, f takes, king g6. Now that we have forced our opponent to make yet another sacrifice, we simply fix the game and push forward the pawns. That's it. c6, rook a6, c7, b4, b5, b6, rook d8. That's it. Lights out. That's it. At this moment, opponent immediately resigned. He understood he had no chances. The question is, where did he misplay it? <laughs> where did he misplay it? I mean, I don't know. You ask, me, you ask me, I mean, I don't know where he misplayed it. Because I think probably h5. h5 probably was the last mistake. Here. Because he was trying to stop g4 from happening g4 some king g3 king g4 king g4 uh, uh, king king g4 king g5 etc but in the end trying to be proactive he actually created more problems maybe he should have pushed a4 while he could probably probably but i hope you saw the steps and instead of trying blatantly fo uh, focus on the queen side and create a passed pawn we could actually play for the mate and it's quite an amazing how less how little material we actually need to be able to play for the mate we had two rooks and a bishop we easily created the mating net and then at the right moment when the opponent was in the most awkward moment transpose the position to something else and the king remains to this awkward h square uh the question is how does he not do passive defense? Because everybody is taught not to do passive defense. I mean, this is what I mentioned before. History shows passive defense doesn't hold. Yes, I know. I mean, sometimes there are these moments that... Sometimes there are these moments that uh, you have to sit passively. And this is, this is very, very already high level thinking that you already think that my actions actually will cost me something so i'm trying to be active but actually what i'll be trying to do it will make my things worse so sometimes an experienced player actually what is he doing he's doing nothing he's just sitting and doing nothing this is incredibly incredibly difficult thing to do and normally it should lead to a loss but yeah, that's why we love chess, right? It's very, very complicated. <laughs> it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. Um, there's one more interesting game in terms of playing uh, for the checkmate as a bonus. Uh, this one. You're welcome. Uh, actually, here it's not really so simple, but there's going to be a very, very interesting moment in this game. I, I had completely forgotten this game. This is a very, very good game of mine. I played some years ago. But Black was, uh, uh, I think, in National Master. Uh, so, White is better. White is better. I mean, there should be no question. White has two powerful bishops, the knight on g4, rook is ready to be rerouted to e3, and Black has technically material equality. He has the rook, he has the two pawns, but those two pawns, they're very weak. And at the same time, we have an amazing opportunity to play for checkmate as a bonus. You're thinking, wait, again, checkmate? Are you kidding me here? What kind of checkmate if there's no pieces basically on the board? No, you can actually play for the checkmate with a very limited material. And remember, 
we are not playing for the checkmate at all costs. We are using this as an instrument. We're using this as an instrument to get something from our opponent. No, first we play rookie tree. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, bishop c4 check. Rookie tree. We try to activate the rook. He cannot stop it. Rook e7 is simply unstoppable threat. Rook d7 allows to play rook e6 and the sixth rank is just smited away. Cannot do that. So g5 has to be made a window for the king. Rook e7 check. King g6. Now, now this is the tricky moment. So we have activated the bishop on c4. We have activated rook on e7. How can we create any real threats? Now, this is a very, very big moment. Obviously, it's going to involve extra help. It's not going to be enough with just the two bishops, with just the rook on e7. We need more forces. And this is what I said. It's very, very important that when you start... Technically, it's not even yet a converting phase. It's just how you build up an attack but you need to have some kind of a schematic thinking so that you understand the picture you're drawing and one of my favorite examples is that i'm uh, sometimes mentioning my students about the game plan what is your plan what what do you want to do here he says i don't know <laughs> yeah then my favorite reply is can you please draw me something yeah yeah draw what and my answer is no, no, just just draw me something. Just draw me, please. <laughs> so what I'm supposed to draw, right? No. Just just draw. <laughs> you don't know what to draw. And in chess it is exactly the same. You don't know what to draw. You don't know what you're aiming for. It's gonna be some some stripes. You'll be making some random stripes because you have no clue what you want to draw here. Yes, very good. Very good, Julio. Knight e3, g4, but except of knight f1. Knight e3, g4, bishop e6. Bishop e6, get the knight on f5, or bishop on f5, and you're creating an actual mating net. Does it mean we're gonna checkmate again? I mean, doesn't mean we're gonna checkmate. We're just using this as a tool. So after knight e3, bishop d3 we already know we have a clear picture what do we want to achieve we don't want to trade the bishop yeah bishop e6 you want to play g4 you want to play either knight f5 or bishop f5 so he plays a five he tries to he tries to stop it i mean what else i mean what else a g4 f takes h takes Bishop e4 seeking some kind of a counterplay, I guess something linked with rook d2. Now the question is, now this is going to be a trick, tricky moment. Can I play bishop f5, g takes on f5, and what do I need to be careful for? Now this is a very, very tricky moment. So I'm definitely thinking about bishop f5, try to get the pawn on f5 because I'm playing for the mating net. But I always need to be aware of my opponent's countermeasures. I cannot only do all, do all of that work for myself. I cannot imagine myself, I have these amazing and great ideas. I need to think about my opponent. <laughs> this is, I mean, it funnily sounds, this is a teamwork. <laughs> it is a teamwork. You're doing everything. That you're doing for yourself, you're doing for your opponent. Exchange sack, very good, very good. So after bishop f5, takes, takes, rook f5. Now this is something you have to see. And you have to see from afar that this is impossible because of rook g7, check. If you don't see this, you cannot go here. You simply cannot go here, I believe so. Because after knight takes on e5, king takes on e5, rook takes on h7, is this position even winning? I, I don't know. So something like rook d2, rook a2, take on a4? I wouldn't want to find it out. 
So I would go to this position if I have no choice. Yeah, there's so many pawns. Are we are just left with one pawn on f2? Just one. Or if you lose it, it's already a theoretical draw. Rook and bishop versus rook. You open any rook and uh, any endgame book. We know this. This is an easy draw. So, but that is impossible. That is impossible, but because of rook g7 check, but still we need to take care of this. But now comes the tricky moment. The most important moment in the game. After king h5. Yeah, because king h6 simply drops the rook on g7. After king h5, rook takes on h7, rook h6. Now this is where the game is decided. The question. Do we transpose? That is the question. Do we transpose to the endgame? Because we already have provoked our opponent to sacrifice. Okay, maybe not really sacrifice, but we won a pawn on h7. We have a passed pawn on f5. We have two very, very nice light pieces. Is this enough? Now, that is the question. Because I'm thinking, what is the fastest way to try to get this pawn to the final? What is the point? H point, right? We started at the A point to the B point, C point, and I believe now we are at the G point. <laughs> so there's H point and then... No, wait, G was after H, what I'm talking about. Whatever, we are, we are at the final step. <laughs> My alphabet is very bad, I feel. Not enough. Are you sure? Are you sure? I, I guess it comes to this moment. Are you sure? If you're gonna take on Rook takes on H6, are you sure you're gonna win this? Yeah, Loyal Panda, I see you're very strong. You see these ideas uh, very quickly. Looks enough, but are you sure? If you're sure, go there. That's, that's completely fine because we have, obviously, our own thresholds where we feel secure i am not sure let me tell you this i am not sure and i told you in the beginning i try to avoid any trades if i am not sure if it's going to be enough because you can never put it back and to make it even more exciting let me tell you checkmate as a bonus is still not finished <laughs> it's still here it's still here. You can still play checkmate as a bonus. Nothing has finished. I mean, it's quite amazing. We have so few pieces on the board. You can still try to get more. But that's for some reason, many players stop at this moment. They think that's it. That's the best I can do. I just want a point. I should be very, very happy. right? And then for some reason, they trade the rook and they go into this very difficult light piece endgame and then trying to conjure some kind of... Uh, study i mean it's not really so easy so of course we don't trade we don't trade rook d7 the black king is still in the mating net it's not feeling very good there so we can still push f6 if i want to but if i'm gonna push f6 i have to keep in my mind that he wants to sacrifice i would sacrifice i would sacrifice on, on f6 position the rook somewhere i don't know at the queen side take the pawn on a4 try to snatch the pawn on f2 somehow and then we're gonna have it rook and knight versus rook and that's gonna be a draw our opponent wants to do this so we need to stop this rook c8 he is going to push the pawn forward now we simply go for the main king g2 c4 this is desperation but nothing already works now rook d7 yeah rook d7 is much much better king g3 taking away the g5 square after g4 king f4 here here going for the mate here and the final final touch but i already think more more than one move is winning king four that's 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 it 
So we simply deliver the mate with just a rook and a pawn. The knight on e3 stops black from playing any rook c4 ideas. Bishop on b2 is irrelevant. Yeah, Migger, sometimes people do forget that checkmate <laughs> wins the game of chess, but now this was the moment when I twice applied the same principle. Started to play checkmate as a bonus for the first time. I want some material. I could have immediately transposed it to the main game. I continued to play for the checkmate and until it actually was a checkmate. So this was one of those rare occasions when playing for the checkmate as a bonus actually resulted for a checkmate. Not always, not always. So this is quite a unique checkmate. So I'm quite proud of the game. All right. Um. Yeah, so, so the two points, two big points, what I mentioned at the beginning, obviously you can try to divide them in smaller points, but I believe what converting material advantage is all about. Rule number one, simplifying the position. I showed you many examples, many games, how you can try to trade pieces, making the right decisions. The option number two, Rule number two is one of my favorites, checkmate as a bonus. Don't rush with the trades as soon as you want something like an extra pawn, extra exchange, maybe extra piece. You can do that if you are sure that you're winning. If you're not, simply don't do this. But there is the third point. Everybody's gonna hate it, I guess. <laughs> it's the end games. It's the end games. Know your end games. You have to know them, you cannot skip this part, because endgames is simply where the game of chess finishes. I know that some people don't like the endgames, but having some proper knowledge in the endgames is really, really going to help you make very important decisions and be a part of converting the material advantage. How do I train my endgames to high levels? Dvoretsky's endgame manual. Yeah, this is the this is the book I've used many occasions. If you're gonna read it, oh my goodness, you're gonna be much much uh, uh, playing a much stronger level. Thank you, Bunkenator. Thank you. But we still have the end games. I'm not finished. We still have the end games. Um, let me show you a couple of them. Um, so I'll start with the game of Anand. Okay, this time. This time I won't do my own game, so I'll start with the game of Vichy Anand. From Tata Steel Masters, year of uh, 2000, I don't know, 2020, I guess. So they reached this position. Thank you, Loyal Panda, appreciate that. So we reached this position. Uh, Vichy Anand is playing with white, and Jeffrey Xiong, Xiong I, I hope I pronounced his last name correctly, is playing with black. Now, Xiong has played rook g4, and he's threatening to play rook a4, attack the pawn on a3. Now, for Anand, this is piece of cake. No, 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 this is Anand. This is Anand. Pretty sure, pretty sure. Anand against Xiong. So, Anand knows that the pawn on a3, it doesn't matter. But again, if you're not thinking in terms of the schematic thinking you'll cause yourself too much problems yeah exactly yeah anand against xiong so let's say i'll be worried about this pawn so i'll play something like rook f3 because i mean it's under attack right i need to defend it <laughs> thank you Cop. so rook a4 i still need to defend it so something like b5 king e3 b4 takes takes okay maybe this is still winning i mean i'm not arguing but being such a strong, I mean, it's not even the right word. I mean, Anand is the chess legend. I don't think even at a single moment he was considering to defend the pawn on a3. So for him, this was a piece of cake. Pawn on a3, who cares? I mean, I have the two pawns at the center. I have the d-pawn, I have the e-pawn. I need to push them forward. But in order to do that, I need to include my rook into the game. So instead he played first the four. Yes. Rook g3. 
and now we simply activate the rook. And again, check the way Anand does this. Does this? He plays rook g5. Now this is quite quite nice because he knows the pawn end games are the easiest winning end games. He knows that after rook takes on g5, f takes on g5, this is going to be easily winning pawn endgame. So what Xion can do, he takes on a3, rook g8 check, king d7, and rook f8. Attacking the pawn, here, 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 and that's it. Easy. So. White is simply going to advance forward the pawns, black does not have any defensive capability, so I guess b5 you can already take it, uh, rook b3 you take it, so black is simply in some sort of a tsuk -tsuk. that's a tsuk -tsuk. So king f8 is gonna be a check and push the pawn, king d8 drops the pawn, and any rook a2 or rook a1 check. If you are wondering, there is a pawn race? white spawns are gonna march faster they're gonna march faster and there's also the rook behind one of the pawns so this is the ideal position so instead of focusing yourself on how you're gonna defend the pawn on a3 you are thinking about the, what i said the schematic thinking you know the pawn on a3 doesn't matter you activate your rook with a tempo you push the pawns forward and that's it black resigns in a material equal position Although it's dead lost. Um, another example, just a sec, let me uh, let me uh, find one. Oh, this was a very lovely. This was a lo very lovely example. I played this game, some rapid game, years ago, against the Fida Master. So we reached this position. I, I played a brilliant game, <laughs> okay, maybe I'm not gonna uh, uh, boast too much about the game, I, it was a good game. So I played a good game and we reached this position. So Black just played, I don't remember, was it E-Takes on F3, whatever. Now the question is... How are we going to win this position? <laughs> yeah, thank you, F. They leave exhausted but happy. I mean, then I'm happy. I'm also exhausted at the end, you know? I'm sweating, usually. I'm just giving everything, just everything. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I guess too much information, right? Exchange the bishops. Yeah, but the question first is, what do you do about the pawn on f3? Now, I could show you actually the position from the Dreski's Endgame Manual. Do you think this position is in the Dreski's Endgame Manual? No, it's not in the Endgame Manual. I know that the position which will come out of it is in the book. Because I've studied it. I know to what position I can go. Let me explain it to you. So why don't I play g takes on f3? It's like, I saw a pawn, I took a pawn, then I'll think later. So after g takes on f3, let's say, I could give a check on f8 if you really want. Check on f8, bishop f8, and g takes on f3. Just a second, where's my music? All right. So the question is, how I'm going to advance here? Just picture yourself your plan your plan here so most likely we are going to trade the bishop right so i'm going to play something like uh, i don't know something like bishop c6 black is going to wait black is going to wait black is going to wait bishop d5 takes takes sooner or later we are going to reach this position and i'm thinking is this going to be enough because after king e6 let's say here let me just make you a lot of lot of moves. A lot of moves, something like um, I don't know here, here. Ideally, I want to reach this position. I think this is a fortress. 
I'm not sure 100% because let's say king e6, bishop g5, let's say we have... Um, okay, maybe I slightly misplayed it. Because I've studied a very similar ranking. It's going to be extremely difficult for white to crash through. There's no point of entry. So I'm having this position in my head. I'm thinking about this position right here. So I'm going back all the way. So I figure out the pawn on f3 is going to be lost anyway. So what do we do here? We play g3. We are going to take the pawn and keep our pawn structure intact. Thank you. Thank you. Who's at dinner? Appreciate that. Hello. How are you doing? Hello, Pepper. <laughs> This is the second raid, how are you doing? I think it was dinner, right? I saw you were doing a stream earlier uh, on TV. Ah, it's Asya, it's Asya. Hello Asya, how are you doing? Or was it Dina? Dina raid, hello, hello. <laughs> how are you doing? Hope you had a wonderful stream. Uh, you caught me in a fine moment. I'm doing here a bootcamp. Bootcamp is one of my <laughs> favorite favorite topics. I can show my knowledge, uh, show my knowledge, and everybody's appreciating it. Oh, you're roasting again! <laughs> it's the roasting week. Yeah, I, I get it. I get it. Anyway, I mean, you're very very much welcome here. Um, we are on already the second half of uh, of the or the third half, whatever, of the bootcamp. And I'm explaining the concepts of converting the material advantage. So first it was simplifying the position. The second was, uh, what was the second? Yeah, checkmate as a bonus. So right now we just thought to talk about the end games and recognizing uh, very, very uh, familiar patterns. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the hydrate. I mean, I appreciate it. I'm just sweating here. It's very, very hot. <laughs> thank you. So they, again, thank you, Raiders. No, no, not three per week. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> not three per week. At the moment, I'm doing a boot camp every second week. Every se I mean, this time, I think it was technically the third week. Every second week. This is what I'm trying to do. And while you're still here, by the way, I wanted to mention is that this weekend, I'll have the arenas of my chess club. I just still don't know at which moment, which day, but I'm gonna announce it. I mean, yeah, there is a big event coming this uh, weekend, so I still don't know which day at which time exactly, but I'll keep you posted. I need to figure it out. Yeah, that's Dina. That's Dina here. Dina was also doing a lesson yesterday. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't watch it. What was it about? So here we play g3, and our intention here is to play bishop f3 take the pawn here and now the fun part the fun part about this moment thank you cop review thank you thank you you mean with our iran i was about to actually organize a lesson with iran but i i couldn't schedule the time so very happy that dina did it <laughs> yeah okay so the point is now do we play we play h4 do we play h4 here i did play h4 but there's a funny story there's a funny story i mean the correct choice here is to play bishop f3 after bishop h3 bishop d5 trade rookie seven rookie six now this is a winning possession but the funny story here is that let me just show you the final a uh, final uh, position here after after bishop f3 h5 let's say here 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 he has an over the board tournament yeah i know he is gonna play in vegas i i played in vegas two years ago it's a great tournament one of the best i guess united states i did it as a part of my uh united states tour i played in st louis afterwards amazing memories really so that's a, that's a great choice by Ron. so about this position do you believe it this position is interesting in manual 
I, I could even tell you the page. So, so I think it's technically something like this. Um, I think it was this position. Something like this. And there is a very big difference that where the white pawn is standing. Is it standing on h3 or is it standing on h4? Are you probably thinking, wait, I mean, what is the difference here? What are you talking here? Now, there is a major difference. The point being is that with the pawn on h4, it's much more difficult to win this. Much more. I actually, I think I touched this in one of my boot camps, so I'm not going to repeat that. But with the pawn on h3, the best technique for black, I think it was rook here and push g4. I mean, the pawn on h3, this is possible. I don't, I don't, this is probably mind-boggling for you, but the story here, the story here is that I knew this. <laughs> I knew this around here. That h4 is not accurate move. That the pawn is better standing on h3. But I was curious. I was curious if my opponent is gonna know this best defense and I was curious if I'll have the opportunity to actually employ what I've studied in Vreska's Endgame Manual. So I played H4 in spite, because the, the the victory is much, much more difficult. But he blundered away very quickly, so, so it doesn't matter. Um, let me show you more. All right, so this maybe is a little tricky. So again, we have an endgame. I had a plan and he didn't. Yeah, I guess, I guess. <laughs> so this position. How are we going to play for the win? White is having an extra pawn. Can we trade queen e5? Now again, this is the big moment. Can we trade it? Because everybody suddenly feels as a big expert of the rook games. Can we go here? Are you sure this is a good decision? Rook takes on c5. Are you sure? Rook c5 takes. Queen e7 check. King goes uh, here. Take queen a2. Yeah, should be winning. Actually, I think I missed that. <laughs> that is, yeah, that is a very good moment. I think I missed that. So queen d5, c5, c6. But yeah, the black king is weak. That is a very, very good idea. I, I think I missed that completely. Yeah, this looks good. This looks good. So probably then I could already skip what I wanted to say, but I think I'm going to continue it anyway. I wanted to show one thing about the Rook Endgame. So here we are offered to trade Queen E5. Queen E5, Queen E5, Rook E5, King F6. Let's say something like a 4. Because after Rook D5, King E6, or maybe even rook c6 rook a6 the question is is this enough <laughs> no i mean i missed that okay I, I didn't see that by the way um yeah so i'm not sure about this so what i wanted to mention here is that first i try to use the so-called checkmate as a bonus the black king is exposed why cannot i try to checkmate it immediately Queen e8 is threatening with rook d8, creating some mating ideas on queen h8. So he needs to stop that. Rook f7. Now rook d8 was probably still fine. But the point being is I force the opponent to lose a very critical tempo. Rook c7. Cutting off the king. 
King f7 goes rook h6, f4, king h3, king h4, king g5. Now, the major difference here is that our rook is very active, which cannot be said about black's rook. So he tried to activate the king, king h6, king g5, king f5. We're stopping this. King goes here. Uh, yeah, I think it was rook d7. Here. 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 So we simply win a pawn because we are already in a dominating position. And now all we do, we transpose. We again transpose. So again we take from a point A to point B, from point B to point C. We create two connected past pawns and then we slowly, slowly march them forward. So fast forwarding the game. I need to, my, I need to activate my king. My king is completely off the game. So g4. The king is here, everything is moving, and now we simply remember the pawn on the 4 doesn't matter at all. We just push forward the C pawn. Yeah, but I guess it wasn't the fastest plan, Levy, thank you, thank you, but it wasn't the fastest plan. So king d5, king c6, king b7, and the pawn on the 4 doesn't matter. And again, this is one of my most important things that I wanted teach you today is don't be overly focused on such little things as pawns when you are trying to execute your plan so that's it again opponent immediately resign because he knows uh, the pawn on f4 plays no role i'm simply moving forward my uh, c pawn and the g6 pawn uh, plays absolutely no role here but yeah, I think it was SPG who said rook c5, queen e7 was winning on the spot. I just, yeah. He said that, I was like, oh wow, okay. <laughs> I didn't see that. Um, now, there is this very, uh, one of my, again, the favorite rook endgame examples. Uh, this game I played against uh, the leading Estonian grandmaster, Kaida Kolots some years ago and uh, I just gave up another pawn which was at the queen side in order <laughs> no it's not a stalemate I mean I want to play this for win I want to play rook goes here 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 and snatch the pawn so it's gonna be a, a very important rook game game of theoretical importance I'll show you how the game progressed I think I actually I showed this I showed this in my bootcamp about the rook end games, but okay, I can I can always repeat that. So rook d1, rook d8, rook h8, rook h6. Now it appears that suddenly he cannot take on h6 because he is simply losing the pawn endgame. This is a very simple theme of the opposition. And since he cannot take it, takes here, 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 and here. What we have here, it's a bridge. It's so simple. So we are going to play king g7, g5, g6. That's it. He knows this is lost. He resigns. That's it. Very upset. I remember he was after the game. He thought he lost the drone endgame. So let's go back where he actually made a mistake. The question is, is there an obvious question mark for any move that Black made? Yeah, the G pawn somehow wins because the because the Black King is cut so far away. So after rook d1 here, I want you to focus on the next two moves that the opponent made here. So he plays king c6. So he wants to play king c7 and I don't know, get closer to the pawn. That's it. He's lost here. Is it obvious? Is it obvious that King C6, King C7, there's are uh, losing mistakes? Uh, 
Um, this is worth it very time. Very time. I'm not sure what you what you're saying, F. So he lost two very important tempos here. Uh, what what do you mean every every time? I, I'm I just don't understand the question. What 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 was the question? About the paired pawns, but so here he actually and he played it without thinking. Ah, it was late to ask about something else. I I st <laughs> sorry. I mean, I still don't understand the question. Ah, uh, is if possible always? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yes, if possible, always play for the paired pawns. Of course, I mean paired pawns, past pawns. It's obviously much stronger than just a sole pawn, right? So sole pawn is not as strong as two pawns. So here, yeah, connected past pawns. So now the question is, how he had to play? How did he have to play? And the, actually the first mistake was uh, King C6, which simply loses time. The correct move was Rook F4. Is it obvious? I don't know. Not very obvious. Because King H6, he takes the pawn on G4. If Rook G1, there's no progress. He goes back. Not obvious. So, okay, I still play the same idea, and now comes the most difficult move, but maybe there's other drawing moves here. Rook a4, now this is a very deep move. He's preparing for me to play rook h6, uh, rook h8, rook h6, king g5, so that the rook is not under attack, and he is making sure that the black king is gonna race to g8 and if we have studied some of the end games we know that with the g pawn the king simply needs to sit in front of the g pawn and it's gonna be a draw in the rook end games we know this at least if you've studied some rook end games so here after rook h8 the king cannot still take it's gonna be rook takes on g4 rook h6 King g5 and whatever let's say uh, I guess the last chance is to play rook g6 rook a1 try to cut off the black king and white simply cannot progress there's no progress here king h6 is gonna be a check and uh, yeah I guess this is a fielder position right and something like rook b6 king g7 now this you can simply sit in a passive defense. And again, you open an endgame book and it's there. It's there. So having studied some important endgames will allow you to save points. Yeah, so simply sit in a passive defense. It works again with the A pawn, with the B pawn, H pawn, G pawn. Doesn't work with the F pawn or any other pawns. So with these pawns, Passive defense doesn't work. But I already talked about this in the Rook Endgame, so I'm not gonna touch it here. What I wanted to mention is that Endgame studies will bring you points. So that is part of the converting material advantage. So again, let me remind you, it was trading the uh, transport... Uh, Transforming the advantage, trading pieces, knowing when to trade, how to trade. The second was playing for the checkmate as a bonus. And the third big one is the end games. Know your end games, study your end games. I think it's a great moment, a great start to study Jesus de la Villa. De la Villa, I apologize. I apologize how does it spell correctly? One kind of end games you should know. I think for every player loves chess this is going to be a great addition yeah i vaguely have read it because i i think that dreski's endgame manual is more serious literature but yeah jesus de la villa yeah yeah 
that, that's him. 100 endgames you should know. And there's also various interesting videos on YouTube how celebrities, including Magnus Carlsen, they're trying to solve the endgame end games coming from that book. It's actually part of the chessable course. So they have made it, not a course, but a chessable book. It's in a digital form. And uh, yeah, they're using this uh, chessable course. I think Magnus made one mistake. He made one mistake in one of the one of the puzzles. So, but overall, he was, I think, one of, if not the best, then one of the best. He was very, very good, obviously. Yeah. So, study your end games. Um, okay, I don't think I'm gonna show any more end games because this is uh, this is not the topic of today. So today's topic was converting the material advantage. So I want still to underline a couple of things. So a couple of important qualities is being patient. Being patient and having a clear plan that you want to carry out. You need to have a clear picture what you want to do here. About the end games, there's obviously the two weakness rule, and I had one game about the two weaknesses I showed to you. And of course, uh, yeah, like I mentioned, have a clear plan. Um, don't be afraid to make prophylactic moves and study your end games. So that's it. I think overall that is the that is the technique of converting the material advantage. So I hope I got it in in a big picture. I show you some examples. My absolute favorite, obviously, is is uh, playing for the checkmate as a bonus. This is something I'm trying to do every single time if I have the opportunity. Because I mean, checkmating is the fastest way to end the game. Some people do forget it for some reason. They're pressing for this uh, very difficult end game technique. Try to checkmate your opponents if possible even if with limited material. <laughs> what are you laughing there, Pepper? It's true, it's true. <laughs> I'm not trolling. Maybe even if I am. <laughs> right, right. All right. Um, <laughs> Checkman is good, Checkman.